Hi, my name is Julie Joyce. I'm the Curator of Contemporary Art at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And I'm very pleased to be speaking about Dan Duque. It's really interesting for me to be able to see this work and also look back on part of Dan's history. For instance, this particular painting here, composition, which is or takes its name after a, a Liechtenstein painting. And it also has Dan's typical, iconic, masterful way of blending photorealism into a, the third dimension. I certainly credit him with. Of course, there are a lot of other influences, such as pop and other movements that run throughout his work. I could go on and on, but I'm particularly pleased to see this work here. What they look like are composition notebooks. They are enlarged, but they are all painted surfaces. Here we have references not only to his childhood or his years as a student, working with a composition notebook like so many of us did, but also specific references down here, these stickers, which look very much like stickers that any student would put on their notebook are actually, again, paint on canvas. Here he has included an image of Pasadena City College, his alma mater, where he met fantastic influences in artists like Ben Sakaguchi. There's also references to the Royal Rose Court, and anyone who grew up in Pasadena would recognize that immediately. Uh, the Rose Bowl, Bob's Big Boy. We also have a replica of a little announcement or bookmark from one of Dan's shows at the Jack Glenn Gallery way back in the day, and that's from 1975. And you see actually an image of one of his photorealist paintings in that as well. I think this is the masterpiece of all time. I think the strongest piece in this show. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what led you to this. And what we're looking at here is what looks like, for all intents and purposes, a concrete berm or barrier that you would find on a freeway off-ramp or right. in a construction zone. But we are looking at the back of the piece, and it is all constructed canvas. It's a barricade. Sometimes they're referred to as K-rails, and you see them along the freeway, as you indicated, and sometimes during times of stress, they'll block uh, governmental buildings' entrances with them. From the viewing side, it looks heavy and substantial, like a barricade, complete with skip marks from an impact, mm -hmm. and I wanted kind of a cry, a moan, a howl to be felt when you looked at it. <laughs> uh -huh. And I thought the only way to achieve that was to have the residue, or what appeared to be the residue, of some sort of impact. In order to, to make a painting, I have to look at what I'm painting, but I wasn't about to bring a barricade into my small studio, so I would just drive around and get out of my car and look at barricades. And they were all chipped up because they saw a lot of abuse. So I said, well, I gotta put chips and dings and stuff like that on mm -hmm. In fact, this is so realistic looking. After like three days of the show, Peter called me and he was panicked. He said, somebody broke one of these. Oh. He said, a man stood at the far end and said, I wonder if I could lift this. And he grabbed the, the O-ring, which looks like it's made out of steel, and he tried to pick the barricade up from, from that carved piece of wood and it broke the wood and then he ran out of the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to repair it so there was nothing lost. So I guess maybe in a weird way that's some sort of a compliment. Mm -hmm. Because what I've done is I've taken something that functions in our society that is useful and has meaning and purpose and I've rendered it useless to function only as a work of art. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the goal. You've also taken something that most people would just sort of walk by and not pay much attention to. By putting it in the gallery setting, you're calling my attention to it. And what I think of when I see this is Southern California and freeways <laughs> and being an Angelino and growing up here. And we do see a lot of them. We do, and I think that your work has this 
they have these personal triggers to them. Well, they would have to because all of my work is made by me without studio assistance, without professional fabrication. I have believed my entire life that, for lack of a better term, term I'll call it artistic truth, emanates in the human body. And for that to come forth and be experienced, I have to make the stuff myself. Mm -hmm. So I make all of this stuff myself. So Dan, this piece is enormous. <laughs> I think it's the biggest piece I've ever seen you make. I'm not sure if that's true. It's the largest dimensional painting I've, I've made. And what inspired this? My wife and I were taking a, a road trip up the central coast of California, and we were in a small town called Los Alamos mm -hmm. at a bakery, and we were sitting outside, and I was looking across the street, and there was an outhouse sitting across the street, and it just like spoke to me, and I said, I. I want to make one of those. Mm -hmm. This doesn't look anything like the, the outhouse that I saw. When I was a small child, my grandmother took me on a trip with her across the United States on the Greyhound bus. And we ended up in North Dakota, where she was raised on a farm. And we went to visit that same farm, and it had an outhouse. They still had outdoor plumbing. And that experience was a profound kind of experience for me because I was born and raised in Los Angeles. We always had indoor plumbing mm -hmm. and we never had to go outside and sit on a wooden plank. <laughs> so it's something that stuck in my head. I never thought that I would make a work of art. So Dan, I see that it has what look like functioning hinges. Is that what I'm seeing? That's what you're seeing, a functioning outhouse would have to have a functioning door. You would want to close the door, I would think. <laughs> um, these hinges that look like hinges are not actually hinges. These are cast resin replicas that I made of hinges and glued them on to look like hinges that are rusted and tattered and have seen some abuse, as is the handle and the clips that join the two pieces of plywood. And then the surface looks very much like grained wood. There was a place in California on the trip where I saw the outhouse we were headed, a place where I always wanted to visit, even when I was a student at Pasadena City College back in the Paleolithic period. I'd read an article in the LA Times about this new development with this cutting edge modern architecture called Sea Ranch. So I wanted to go and experience Sea Ranch. It had been in my mind for decades. So we went to Sea Ranch or we spent a couple days, and I did a lot of walking around outside, and all of the buildings had turned gray, and mm -hmm. then beyond gray, it got bleached out. And I was taken with the, the kind of metallic silver that the wood had turned, and I, that was the inspiration for the coloration on this painting. I was really taken with this piece and really happy to see it and also thought immediately of some of your past work with boxes. When you started doing the three-dimensional paintings, they were with simple cardboard boxes and then they evolved into other kinds of amazing commercial packaging, cigar boxes, but this is a completely new series and I understand it has again, a personal reference for you, and I wondered if you could talk about that. My mother loved red, and she carpeted our entire living room and dining room in bright red, two and a half to three inch high shag carpeting. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so I lived in the red world for many years. Decades and decades later, I was involved in a family project along with my brother-in-law, and he is into motorcycling and outdoor adventuring on his motorcycle and he brought his toolbox and I would look at that toolbox every day so and I liked it. So this is a painting of his toolbox with his various uh, stickers from events and manufacturers that he likes. So you can see that it's, uh, you know, it's not really a toolbox. You couldn't use it as a toolbox. It is indeed a painting. So Dan, why don't you just use real hinges? 
I was asked once uh, that same question. In fact, it was on, I think, my second show at OK Harris, which was the first show of the boxes. And a man, a collector, came up to me, looked around the room, and said, you do everything the hard way, don't you? <laughs> and I guess maybe I felt like it wouldn't be um, real if I didn't make it myself, if it hadn't been processed through my, my body somehow. And the only way for me to do that was to make it. I feel that the uh, um, artistic truth uh, resides in the human body. And in order for me to you know, express that sort of truism, I've got to make it. Mm -hmm. I'm in love with these books. When did you start doing them, actually? I started painting books uh, probably in the 1990s, make, let's say the 2000s, mm -hmm. were the first book paintings. These just speak to me personally. Some of these books are the ones that I've pawed through so many times, writing essays or trying to figure things out philosophically or art historically. You taught for how many years at Cal State LA? 32. 32, and I know you were incredibly influential Several of your students have openly praised you and acknowledged you in very interesting ways. I think Kaz Oshiro, for instance, you were a mentor to him. Are you still in touch with Kaz? Kaz and I are still in touch. I'm very proud of his success. I think he's a great artist. Mm -hmm. When I started at Cal State LA, I was hired in 1975. It was a great honor to actually have a job to know that I was going to be able to pay the rent the next month. And to stand up in a class of 40 young, eager people wanting to know about art and to talk and then get paid for talking about it. My enthusiasm sort of blossomed and grew as I talked and found my footing as a, as a lecturer in the classroom. And uh, I think these books, most of these I have in my library. I read them decades ago. These are books that you can't read. <laughs> There's no content in these books. They're just little paintings. It was important for me to show that whatever I made a painting of, whether it's new or old, that it has been touched, that it itself has a history of contact with the human being. And usually that history physically manifests itself in old torn labels and smudges and dirt and wear and things like that. Mm -hmm. You've made several different computer packaging boxes. I know you did the earlier versions of the iMacs or the Apple computers as well, which were pretty fascinating. You're making these pointed references to the way you see, but also the way we see, and the way in which information is, is transmitted to us or mediated to us. And I find that these kind of references they pop up in a way that's very kind of fun and pop-like, but at the same time, if you think about this, it makes your work, I think, resonate on a really deep level. It's a package. Stuff in a, in a capitalist society, in which we are part of, is packaged and sent out to us to use or understand including information on the computer and the iPhone. It's packaged information. And I was uh, very interested in the idea of the computer when it first arrived on the scene and what that meant. And I was particularly taken at that time with the euphoria that surrounded it. Like, we're gonna all exist. It was a Western society, utopian dream of living in computer paradise. And I was always a little bit leery of anything prompting us to live in paradise. I thought, maybe it's coming with catches or problems, which has proved to be the case, actually. Would you say you're a bit of a Luddite? I would say I was a Luddite. <laughs> I resisted the computer far too long. I use, it to the, I use it now, and I find it incredibly handy to research on, to store imagery on, and to communicate with, which was what it was designed to do. So I'm happy to have one. In fact, this is the container my computer came in. I made a painting of a turn of the century safe. And I was interested in making this painting for several reasons. 
one of which was that it's a painting on which there's another painting. So it's a painting with a painting on a painting. And the painting is a, what looks like a 19th century Beardstadt type landscape. And, and the, turn of the 19th century and these old heavy metal safes that were produced, they were often sold with landscape paintings painted on the doors by a factory painter. And I found that in really interesting. So I made my, my version of the safe and this is it. I looked at a few images of safes. I had a show in Reno, Nevada, both at the museum and at the Stremel Gallery, uh, one after the other. And I stayed in uh, the Legacy Casino, which has a complete uh, display of silver, silver wealth. And there's an old safe part of it where they used to put the, the silver, I guess, or the funds that you know, they, they gathered from selling the silver. And I liked it. And so I. I you know, thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and eventually years later I made this painting.